Olivia Milburn is a professor of Chinese language and literature at Seoul National University, where she's now been employed for over a decade. She was first drawn to Chinese literature after reading an English translation of the classic novel, The Dream of the Red Chamber, or some of you might know that as uh, The Story of the Stone, Dream of Red Mansions, uh, and it's by Cao Xuechen. She completed her first degree in Chinese at St Hilda's College, University of Oxford, um, then a master's in Oriental Studies at Downing College at Cambridge, then a doctorate in Classical Chinese at the SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Uh, in addition to her work in Seoul, she served as a lecturer, visiting professor and a visiting scholar at universities in London, mainland China, Hong Kong and Singapore. Quite an impressive uh, list right there. She's offered several books, including che uh, che sorry, Cherishing Antiquity, The Cultural Construction of an Ancient Chinese Kingdom, The Spring and Autumn Annals of Master Yan and Urbanization in Early and Medieval China, Gazetteers for the City of Suzhou. So in, it was in collaboration with Christopher Payne that she translated Empires of Dust, but also two spy novels by Mai Jia, a very interesting author. Uh, um, one of those two novels was Decoded, which was a bestseller. In 2018, oh, I, I did not, this is news to me. It's very nice. So in 2018, Olivia Milburn's translation work was rec recognized by the Chinese government with the Special Book Award of China, which honors contributions to bridging cultures and fostering understanding, which that's what Sino's books is all about. So that's what we like. Uh, now I'll introduce Jiang Zilong. He is not here today, uh, but he's except from in spirit, of course. So uh, Jiang Zilong was born in 1941 in Hebei province, that's in northeastern China. I think where this novel is set as well. Uh, he spent his formative years in the countryside before moving to the city of Tianjin at the age of 14. He served an apprenticeship at a machine tool factory and then joined the Navy in 1962. From 65 to 82, he worked at a factory in Tianjin, rising to the ranks of senior management and publishing his first written works on the site. He's been a full-time author since leaving the country and became, the found, became known as the founder of Reform Literature that we'll be talking about, hopefully, Olivia. Uh, reform literature deals with the policy of reform and opening up that was initiated by Dong Xiaoping following the death of Mao Zedong. Many of Jiang's stories are set in the industrial world and examine the impact that the seismic socioeconomic changes have had on the lives of ordinary Chinese citizens. His works have won national literary awards many times and have been translated into multiple languages, including French, German, Russian, Japanese, Spanish, and of course, English, which is why we're here today. So there's your introductions of the people. Now I'm going to say hello, Olivia. Great to have you here. I'm delighted to be invited to join you on this occasion. Yeah. OK, so I know I already gave quite a lengthy bio for you, but I wonder, could you tell us any nuances to your career that we didn't cover there? And maybe anything else about your work as a translator you'd like to mention? OK, so. Um, Actually, my new project is related to um, history of Chinese literature, specifically written writing, um, because at the moment the development of Chinese fiction is really badly understood. And you have a model at the moment where um, fiction and novel writing kind of comes out of nowhere in the Ming Dynasty, and you have have the, the great Chinese novel suddenly emerging at this stage. And I want to change this because the fact is that there's a great deal of earlier, really, really interesting, really important Chinese fiction that basically gets ignored. And yeah, that's gonna kind of, it's gonna cause some ructions because it's, new model for, for thinking about fiction writing in East Asia and for thinking about the novel and in world literature. Mm, that does sound yeah. exciting. Yeah. I, ho I hope you do ruffle a few feathers. Yeah, that would be fun. I wonder... uh, already has. Oh, good, <laughs> so... good. <laughs> yeah. Rubbing my fingers gleefully. Um, to follow up on that, are you going to be translating any of those pre-Ming fictions uh, as well as just writing about them? Yes. So um, this, is, this is going to be a kind of dual project to both translate 
and do studies. Um, and I actually published the first volume in what's going to be mainly, um, which is translation of Zhao Fei and Wai Juan, which is a really, really early Tang Dynasty Chinese novel. Um, translation and study. That's awesome. So, Wonderful. Good fun. Right. So zooming back to the 20th century, let's let's look at the where and when of Empires of Dust. So I already mentioned uh, we're in the Northeast and we're in reform and opening. But for for people who are not so familiar with what those mean in the Chinese context, can you can you run us through it? OK, so um, this particular novel, the, the background is kind of a hellhole, right? I mean, the, where, where this is set is a really, really poor part of China. And it's an area that has suffered really significant environmental degradation, particularly in the 19th century. And the legacy of that is essentially you have a village in unsustainable economic circumstances. And yet this terrible background of gross impoverishment produces a guy who is determined to change stuff. And that's the main character of this book. And it's, I guess, a it's kind of an epic to portray somebody born into really grinding poverty and poverty where there, there's essentially no way out of this because you are talking an, an area which has been utterly devastated um, by this state um, through successive droughts and so on. And, you know, these areas just have not recovered. And it's, it's a real fight to get anything out of this environment. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the book kicks off, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, what just before or during the Chinese Civil War? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And then if you if we know our Chinese history, we know the Civil War is hardly the end of matters. We've got more war and then more turmoil. So I know the the I was pitching this book at the start as being about the economic reform in the eighties, but mm, what have yes. we got to get through in the novel before we get to that? Yes, the, 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 the absolute horror of, yeah, the, the, I mean, it, it's kind of a combination of political factors because the communist government under Chairman Mao was not exactly very economically orientated. So you have the mm. government not being helpful but that's also coupled with ingrained generational poverty and lack of opportunity and social structures and customs that are really, really seriously militating against anybody being able to improve their lives. And the community just, most people have just given up, right? I mean, how, how can you fight against this? And yeah. the, main, the main character has not given up. He's absolutely committed to the idea that somehow, sooner or later, there's going to be a way to change things. And he's going to take any opportunity that comes up to improve things. And he's not just interested in improving things for himself. He's really focused on the clan, you know, making things better for his family, the community as a whole, because he's living in a clan village. So he's basically related to everybody else in, in this community. And it, it is a fight, not just for himself, but for the survival of the community as a whole. Yeah. And I think the thing about clans is that's uh a good thing to raise because 
in that sample chapter we shared where we're like well into the sort of final stages of the novel family family allegiances and family ties are still driving the drama or maybe driving the drama even more than before and in turn dictating the shape of the politics to the point of um very black comedy i think yes yes yeah i mean the, 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 there are moments of, of great humor in this book um and yes the 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 clan structure is is really important i mean to, to a certain extent, when I was translating this book, I was thinking this isn't really very much like a novel. This is like anthropology. This, this is sociology. This is how the clan reacts, you know, not, not just the individual, but how this group reacts to being hauled out of poverty by this this one man. Yeah. And as, as well as families being, well, kind of the structures of families staying intact, you also see people going through these different phases of history. So in that sample chapter, we have our main guy, Watson Xian, our, our entrepreneur of the story. But we also have names and players who've gone through him through these stages of the People's Republic of China. So there's a not in not massively long, but there's a pretty sizable section where we go through uh, some of the more manic parts of the Cultural Revolution, which yes. is it, it's an it's an interesting section of the book that just in the fact that it got published inside China, but it's there regardless. Yes. And yeah, yeah, we we see we see what an entrepreneur would do to survive a totally uh, an environment you'd think would be totally hostile to um, you know a, a guy who is a has DNA and business in his or sorry has business and entrepreneurism in his DNA how that yes. plays out in that environment and how his yes. friends and enemies navigate that with him and then you see those same people using their same sorts of built-in personalities to run conglomerates uh, chemical production uh economies of scale so yeah I, I got off the track a little bit there um i'll go back to my my pre-arranged uh, pre pre-formulated questions just to say if, if you were handing this book to someone who had never read a chinese literature before wasn't so familiar with china what sort of primers if any would you want to give them um i think it's really important to think of this as a book where you've got it, it's not exactly two halves, it's like the first two thirds are one kind of story and the last third is, is a completely different kind of, of book. And the author, it seems to me, is, is really worried about the direction of things. And that when he's writing this book, He's on the one hand looking back at the struggles of the past, and that's the first two thirds. The, the, the description of poverty, ingrained generational deprivation is, is really fine. And that's one thing. But when you get to the last third, you've actually got something quite different. And it's a format that's very unfamiliar, I think, to most people in the West, but it, it's something that you see quite a lot in China, which is the business novel, where you're getting an introduction to certain business ideas through fiction. And that's kind of interesting. And there really aren't many examples of this in, in English language literature. The only person I've ever I've, I've ever come across who's tried this is Emma Latham, um, which is actually a pair of writers, um, a Latsis and a Hennessy, um, who who tried to write English language fiction in the seventies and eighties, um, explaining business ideas through literature, and the last third of this book is explaining business how how a clan owned enterprise works. And then also um, what, the, what the coming problems are. 
And this, this is really a searing indictment of all sorts of different aspects of Chinese contemporary life, politics, business. Yeah, it's, it's very tough. The guy is, the, the author's really critical. Yeah. Um, Daniel's just popped a couple of uh, interesting links in the chat. They're both uh, sort of a review or an intro to the book, but they also, I guess, for to help out people reading, they go into a little bit what reform literature is. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as you were saying that, like, I, I thought you were going to say there are um, no other examples of this sort of Chinese lit in English translation, which is true, but your point it, there it's that, rare, but I mean, yeah. there are other people who've tried doing this kind of thing with explaining business um, um, through fiction, but it, it's not common in right. West societies, but it really is in China. Right. Well, well what I was going to say there is, like, can I think of an example of someone writing in English uh, doing this? And the only one that's vaguely comparable I can think of is Ayn Rand, but she wasn't trying to explain business from a neutral or critical perspective. She was pumping out her own ideological worldview yeah. of what yeah. she thinks for the free, yeah, free that, market. That, that's, quite, that's quite a different kind of thing. And yes, yes and Dang Zilong is really critical of a lot of what he is seeing, and yeah. rightly so. Um, yeah, it, it's more like yeah. a piece of fiction than a, yes. a thousand page rant. Um, yeah, so getting, again, trying to take myself back on track here. Uh, we've talked a bit about reform literature and business literature. Um, I've asked you how we would prep someone. Uh, how about this question? Like, what sort of a protagonist is Guo Sun Qian? So you, we mentioned you mentioned that the hardship he was born into sort of produced him as a person. Like early on, he's trying to figure out better ways to do farming in his town because people are dying of starvation. And yet, in our sample chapter, he's turned into a local tyrant so how do you get from a to b and what sort of a protagonist do we call him like is he an anti-hero is he a villain protagonist um is he a tragic hero how would you think about those terms in relation to him i, th I think actually yes the, the main character is is a very very interesting person and the the key seems to be that the author Dan Zilong wants wants to show him as somebody who has had vast wealth bestowed relatively late late in life and at a stage when many aspects of his personality and character have already been set. So it's not, it, one of the problems that he has is, is clearly lack of education. He can't change sufficiently um, to adapt to the opportunities that wealth brings. Um, yeah. It's come to him too late. And in some ways, that's kind of a tragedy that he hasn't got the the training and background and education to be able to deal with the new circumstances he finds himself in once he becomes really wealthy. Um, I think some of the problems would, would not be the case if, if he had sort of more understanding of how the world works. You know, he's a, a he's a peasant who has suddenly got really, really rich. And he doesn't know, he doesn't understand that the regulatory structure has allowed him to become rich, but they can also destroy him. They are letting him get away with things for a certain amount of time. But the moment he steps out of line in a bad way, they are going to crush him. And he doesn't see that because he doesn't have the understanding of how the world works to be able to, to really deal with that. So, I mean, talking about heroes and villains is kind of, 
it's 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 sort of irrelevant and also in in one way um what another thing that Jiang Zilong really really emphasizes right at the end of the book is that Guo Tsun he still has a really really strong plan feeling and he he, yes, he does bad things, but he also does good things, and he and he really does care about his clan. Yeah. The next generation coming in, they don't care at all, and that's gonna be bad. That social relationships have really broken down, and what that world is going to look like would be really quite unpleasant. Yeah. Makes me think quite a lot of the, the, the most famous gangs and gangsters in the world were often able to best keep their operations running by providing a sort of a well, uh, state within a state welfare system for people in the areas where they operated. Um, or you, and you can see it in fiction as well, like thinking of the TV show, The Wire, you have a, a yes. gang who are bad, but not that bad not outright evil, the Barksdales, uh, but when they're removed or when they're brought down by more dangerous, younger players, the power vacuum that creates is far more scary. You know, that's, um, it's, you know, replacing organized crime with either ruthlessly organized crime or disorganized crime. You know, it's- Yes, and, and it's, it's really not a positive movement. And, um, the thing is that I guess this is one aspect of the kind of cultural background that um, Western people would be really unfamiliar with, the strength of the clan and the way that many clans have clan organizations to help. And for the last thousand years, you've had things like clan banks that... Um, clan members can call on for finance and clan owned enterprises, all of these kinds of things. These um, cooperatives that are set up and owned and managed by a clan. Um, and a lot of these are now international. And yeah, Jiang Zilong seems to be really worried because um, as absolutely everybody knows, the regular Chinese banks have loaned way, way, way too much money to some really, really shady speculative things, and that's going to cause a lot of problems. Um, the question is that he's raising in this book is how badly are the clan banks exposed? And that that's very difficult to answer because most people don't even know that clan banks exist. Um, and yeah, they're often very opaque. Um, and yeah, it could cause a lot of problems. A hard thing to answer and a hard thing to turn into an interesting story, for sure. Uh, on the topic of oh, an interesting oh, no, no, I mean, clan, clan bank things. That they, they're, well, to, genuine, to, they're genuinely fascinating. Well, these put, put it like work. this then, to, to dramatise with some yes. uh, powerful characters. Like what, what you were yeah. saying about Guo not being a completely bad guy. Like you can see there's some quite real, or at least felt very real to me, uh, unflattering conflict in him in, in our sample chapter. So he's his actions have led to a family being collectively unjustly victimised. And his way of dealing with that is just based on his own life experience. He does a sort of cultural, he just impromptu, he does like a cultural revolution style denouncing of them, uh, all just baselessly riling up people's emotions. And then after the family's fate has been sealed, he goes away and he thinks, oh, I hate them because they've made everything so much more difficult for me. But also I hate myself because I'm well aware I just did something completely unjustified to just make my own life easier. and. Uh, I feel like there's a give it, given the power and the opportunity. I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. He's, just, you know, he's just not ready for that sort of responsibility. And like you said, he's been through. He didn't have any uh, classes in school. 
where they told him, be nice, think about other people, because he spent his life surviving. And yes, if you've struggled like that, with this kind of really, really heavy burden, uh, it's not just you personally that you're hauling out of poverty, it's your whole community that you, you, you're responsible for. That's, that's really tough, yes. Mm. I was wondering, think, thinking about his character and how he becomes corrupted by, I guess, his own success, how do we see that corruption play out? Uh, and I've, I've put three little uh, adjectives here, not three, five, I can't count, five little adjectives, uh, moral, economic, biological, we'll be thinking of the environment, sexual, uh, skip that one if we like, and existential, because um, I think all of these things are in the book in quite interesting ways. Yes, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, some of the some of these are kind of easy you, the to talk about. I mean, he's he's unfaithful to his wife, of course. Extremely, yeah. Yeah, you know that, and his wretched wife has not done anything to deserve the horrible way that he's treated by her husband, um, but. Yeah. Um, yes, really, really. I suppose depressingly conventional, the, the way that the minute he can, he treats himself to a new woman. Um, and then, yeah, the, the environmental side, the place where he comes from, this was absolutely wrecked with El Nino um, drought in late 19th, early 20th century. It hasn't recovered. And therefore, you know, adding to that with massive environmental pollution through the chemical plant and this and the other, um, one of the kind of symbols of the drugness of this kind of unbridled modernization is the sacred trees oh, yeah. in, in the community that are gradually poisoned and right at the end are pretty much dead. These, these ancient trees that have survived so many things are finally unable to survive the chemical warfare. Them. And yeah, the the moral corruption, the way that he comes to believe that he can do anything, that other people cannot control him, that they don't get a say, that he's he's like emperor where he is. Yeah. And it, it, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, no. I mean, th th this is one of the things with, where you see the, the lack of education. He doesn't understand the extent to which other people let him get on with it. They let him get away with stuff. But that's a choice. Um, the minute they decide they've had enough, they can crush him. Yeah, I was going to say, um, from, from what I remember reading the novel, as it progresses, um, especially in from any kind of... Uh, the reform and opening up section, the little town we're in, Guajadien, becomes more and more beholden and connected with the outside world. I guess that's partly just the buildup of uh, infrastructure, first in the sort of socialist construction period, and then the marketization that uh, multiplies all that infrastructure that's already there. So yeah, he's he's grown up in a small town, or small village rather, isolated, mm -hmm. and keeps that mindset, but of course... Yeah, like you said, he's yeah, in you know, reality. He, he, he really has no idea about just how serious other people are going to take some of this, some of the stuff he does. I mean, and that and sounds how, like how easily he can be destroyed. 
sounds like a good description as me of me as a kid just before getting caught by my parents to be honest didn't <laughs> the only reason i was being bad is because i didn't realize how bad it was and how that i was being watched yeah 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 no. Uh, oh yes so those trees you mentioned the magical trees um in yes. my interview with Christopher where where we talked about the book of my podcast they came up because they they appear early and yes. reading the book I was thinking oh is this seems like like a, a little bit like 100 years of solitude am I, am I about to read a Chinese version of an epic uh Latin American magical realism book and then of course a few chapters in you realize no not really because there's no magic and it's all no, no, it's all, no, it's, all no, it's too no, real no, this is all this is real. all this is all real stuff yeah, yeah yeah but i was going to say there it, there are to me some similarities at least with 100 years of solitude we've got a big cast who stay with us and we have changes uh, pl ch shifting political eras uh, but the 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 trees i think what happens to the trees is a decent metaphor because yeah you have what might have been a, a pre-modern untouched pristine natural world just take taking one beating then another beating and then another yes. beating and then the magic is you know the magic is gone and then it's very gone and we're we're in the world of money and material stuff yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah and and, and the, these kinds of um feng shui forests and the sacred forests all over china they're, they're being destroyed now i mean this is this is real. Mm. Um, there's a line in the book that I, I used for the description of the episode, like a little quote at the top of my episode uh, that really jumped out at me. It's the earth is a vomiting carcass, which is all sorts of uh, horror literature packed into six English words there. But I wanted to ask, do you think the book is making any statements about people or the world in general? beyond uh, beyond the PRC, since it says the earth, and not just like Guajadien. No, I mean, I, the, the author certainly has um, an interest in environmental topics and a serious concern about what people in general are doing to the planet. Um, not just in China, but more widely. And, and of course, that is something that you know, many people around the world absolutely share, that uh, certain aspects of traditional culture, traditional faith, preserve the environment for thousands of years, and then money and late stage capitalism and so on come along and they aren't surviving now mm. yeah right um i would like to continue talking about uh soil and agriculture um because that is an interesting topic in itself but i'm gonna ask another sort of a question about forms things take so i asked you what forms does corruption take and uh, now i'll ask what forms does power take so okay so we see we, we, we i think i guess we've made it clear that guatsun chien gets rich becomes powerful yes. but what things give him that power how is he able to use it what positions does he hold so on so on yes yeah, so essentially what happens is there, there's a tragedy and a, a, a small child dies. And he is able to use compensation payment to the parents. You know, he basically corrals the compensation payment to the parents and puts it to use to improve the village. And that that seed money is what he needs to set up his clan and enterprise. And from that one successful clan owned enterprise, he can then build up a whole series of things for his clan. And yeah, the, the, the power is really, really tightly linked to the Guo family. He, he is the head of the 
clan-owned businesses, a, a business empire. And as with so many of these things, you know, a lot of the time outsiders looking at these things, they don't necessarily realize that you're looking at a clan. Um, but once you get, once you're on the inside, you can see that part of what happens here is that you have clan status and business acting, reinforcing each other to, to give him power within the community. Yeah. And given that it's China, how, how do we see the, uh, the, the government and the, the party dealing with these clans in the novel? I mean, without maybe we don't want to spoil the end. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so in, in this case, in this case, the decision of the Communist Party is basically just to leave these people alone, um, and that's quite common with 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 clan owned in, clan owned enterprises, and always has been. And for the last thousand years, um, they have mostly been set up to be pretty opaque from a regulatory point of view and um, governments mostly do tend to leave them alone. Right. At least in, at least in China. Um, other places are more aggressive but with not noticeable success. And sorry if I'm if I'm quizzing you on these clans too much. I just find this really interesting. But in your academic work, do these mm -hmm. topics come up as well? Um, not particularly, no, um, okay. mainly because mostly with, with kind of academic research, I'm looking more at earlier periods. Um, so the thing is that um, from a point of view of, yeah, actually, now that I think about it, of course, there is one massive overlap, and I, I did do a certain amount of research on clan-owned enterprises because the mm. very first one is from is, is set up in Sudo oh. in the Song in the Song Dynasty by the Fan clan. Fan Zhongyan um, is the founder of the known clan enterprise, and in the book I did, as it is on the city of Sudo. Um, there, there's a really, really big chunk of this thing there, which, which is about this very first planning a couple of years ago, um, which, yeah, is, is kind of important. And does that episode in history have its own Watson and Xian? Um, actually, it's much more benign. Um, Fan Zhong Yen, the, as as a small child, his mother, well, after his father died, his mother married again, and he was adopted by his mother's second husband. And as an adult, he wanted to go back to the Fan family and be a member of the Fan family again and resume his original surname. And the Fan clan really opposed this. They were like, you're nothing to do with us. You were adopted, go away. And he, he had to really push to become a member, accepted as a member of the clan again. And it's like in return for being accepted, he organized that his clan has the first family enterprise, family bank. Right, um, I'm gonna ask, a uh, somewhat different question now. Mm. Just thinking about all these topics we've discussed, they're quite a lot of these are quite sensitive or verging into sensitive, difficult areas to talk about in 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 China. And yet, Jiang Zilong, I guess at the peak of his career, uh, uh, it was, I think, a state-supported author, um, very very much kosher sort of figure. So how yes. how does that work, and how is he received, or how was and is he received inside China? Um. Uh, well, the thing is that possibly things now have got a little bit worse, but the, the issue I think here that, that's clear is 
actually a lot of the time, if you're just doing book publication, nobody cares. Book, book publication, whatever. You can publish all sorts of stuff. The issue comes much more if you're going to like do TV or film or something like that. Then, then you might have problems. Um, book publication, a lot of the time, nobody cares. Right. Um, because who reads books? Yeah, right. so it's sort of, yeah, so it's sort of a nuanced uh, critique of market reforms is something that you know the writers association might be quite interested in working with but because it's a more mass media we won't be seeing empires of dust nong min Diguo, the tv show anytime soon no. on <laughs> streaming services no 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 that's that that's that's just not gonna happen and and, and that, that it, i mean I was, I was thinking about this particular question with something like Du Liang, Yang Jian. Um, that's a really, really searing criticism of the PLA. And it's published by the PLA own publishing company, right? I mean, they're, they're absolutely okay with, with, with putting this out. Um, yeah, it, it, for books, it's the rules are, are much more lax but when? you know then, then then they make it into a tv series and then like <laughs> the last third of the book yeah um, it's yeah it's so, pretty mad that last third when the, the the money the money just seems to be unlimited um mm -hmm. i'm gonna ask one final question before we open up the the floor to um to everyone else and uh, this is going to be a complete incredibly abstract um abstract question so answer it how you like so like we we often hear here in the west about how um one person will tell us oh china is is it really is a communist country and then another person will tell you ah they, they say they are but really they're actually a hardcore capitalist country and then you'll hear other yet other people tell you they're a blend of uh both economic systems and i think this not i mean i don't I don't think there is an answer to that question really, but um, in this book, we do see hardcore, uh, both both ideologies um, in, for, in various forms, and in, I guess maybe in various blends. So I don't know, is there anything you would say about that, how you see these big economic and political ideas playing out in the book? Yes, I mean, it's, it's really mixed and, it's it's so dependent on where you are and what time frame you're talking about right. exactly what what is going on um, and it's of course really really difficult for any kind of outside hang of what on earth is going on in in a place that's that big and has such an enormous population and covers such vast territory and so on and um, yeah so reading this I believe the story that the author tells about how you move from a pretty hardcore Maoist environment in the first bit to a really unregulated late stage capitalism in the last third of the book. Um, and that seems completely believable in the context that he's talking about um, and in, in that time, in that place. Absolutely, this seems, this seems to be how it went down. Um, but for other places, maybe not. Right. It's it's a really culturally specific situation that is. Yeah, it's certainly true. If you, um, I think, even if you hopped in a time machine to the the eighties, the nineties, and you went to Shanghai, uh, the wealth disparity and accumulation you'd be seeing would be a quite different flavor from yeah. industrial northern China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we can open the floor now. So, 
does anyone have any burning questions that they'd like to run by Olivia? You can just, I guess, unmute yourself. And um, Daniel, is that possible? Will people be able to just? Uh, oh, yeah. They should be able to. So if you are, uh, we have our first one coming. Ooh, they're oh, rolling. Fair in. enough. Okay. Wow. Wonderful. Okay. Well, okay. Should we um, take Sam's one first? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Sam Hailin asks, have you ever translated a novel like this before? Uh, no, <laughs> so, that, 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 that's an easy thing. So um, other translations I've done have been really quite different. Um, and this was this was very challenging to get, right, to get the feel of it right. And, and it is also so long. Um, it really is an epic novel. So um, yeah, that's that's a lot of lot of work. Okay, next question. This is from uh, Wang Yan, who's got actually two questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll just read the whole thing, uh, but I'll pause after the end of the first question. So uh, Yan says, nice to meet you, Professor Milburn. Uh, Milburn. My questions are not related with translation of Empires of Dust, but with translation of your other books and novels. Um, it seems that you're interested in novels or books on war or military, like The Glory of Yue, Gai Lu, uh, The Kingdom of Pearl, and the modern ones by Mai Jia, Decoded in the Dark, The Message. So Yan's first question is, what fascinated you most in these books on war? Did the ancient ones help you understand the modern ones? Did you find anything in common in these books? Um, yeah, I guess the war thing is kind of accidental. Um, Though I suppose it would be correct to say that warfare really does bring out the best and the worst and most dramatic situations for people. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it, it is certainly very interesting to see what happens when you, when, when you have this kind of um, conflict. And... After, after working with Kingdoms in Peril, that book, it's like this contains the whole of Chinese history pretty much. Um, what, what happens afterwards is just a repeat in many cases. Um, the, the situations that you have described in that book are so kind of archetypal in Chinese culture, it's what everybody's been doing ever since is just repeating these patterns. Um, but that really is amazing to see. I should flag here, by the way, Olivia, you've got to scoot in 10 minutes, I think, is that correct? Okay, so we'll get through the rest of these. Uh, Jan's other question, I think this might be quite a short answer from you. He's asked, if you're interested in uh, books on war, uh, why not translate more classic ones like uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War and Sun Pin? Is that because you think the existing translations are satisfactory? Um, essentially, yes. And also there are already so many translations of these. Um, basically, I have a rule for myself. That I will not touch anything that already has a translation done. Um, I want to do other stuff. Um, there's so much else to translate. And there are so few people working on translating Chinese, classical Chinese into, into English that you have no excuse for this repeating stuff. Um, it's, it's time to do something else. Right. Okay. The, the world does, the world does not need other translations of Tao Te Ching, you know. It doesn't. Oh no! I got to cancel the one I'm working on then. Okay. There are, uh, there are already there are already I think it's like three hundred translations in English. We wow. don't need any more. Holy moly! Gosh. Right. Uh, I'll re recovering from that uh, piece of knowledge. Uh, I'll take Tom Baker's question. Doctor Who, I guess, is on is on the line. So Tom Baker says, hello, I was wondering, did anything in the book really shock you? <laughs> I sure oh. did shock me. <laughs> well, uh, all, all I can say is, as the devoted watcher of the um, CCTV 13 
law and society channel during my many trips to China, where you have all these documentaries about um, Chinese society and tricky legal cases and so on. Actually, no. Um, the the, uh, the watching those documentaries, I think, beat any shock out of me because you know once once you've seen what people get up to in the normal way of things, it's just like right. Um, I I was just thinking. It never occurred to me what this book reminded me of, but um, I don't know how many of us here ever watched Breaking Bad, but there's so many moments in Breaking Bad where I wanted to grab Walter White and be like, what are you doing? Just stop, calm down. Um, and I basically felt the same about, well, he, he just has no chill and it never shocked me how little chill he had and what he's prepared to do to bully yeah, people because they annoyed anno him. Yeah, just no, no ability to calm down. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Right, we've got a question from Max R Radwan. I hope I pronounced that uh, acceptably well. Um, so Max is asking, did translating this novel throw up any unusual challenges? And what was it like translating with uh, co-translating with Christopher Payne? Well, this was the third book that Christopher and I did together. So um, we were quite well. Um, we just sort of like split it down the middle and he did the first half and I did the second half and then some poor unfortunate person had the job think that we'd reconciled um, the characters and things through the translation. Um, there wasn't any kind of really, really glaring change in vocabulary with talking about them. Um, but yeah, it, that, that worked fine. I mean, we, we had a good relationship with translate together on this um yeah no problem really excellent uh, we have a question from jimung tung uh he says hello professor I, I assumed he i have no idea uh jimung says hello professor milburn why is the title of the novel nong min di guo uh not translated literally as the peasant empire so nong min peasant and di guo empire but an of course, the book in English translation is called Empires of Dust. Uh, so he's asked, he or she is asking, why is that? Um, good question. And I don't know because I, wasn't ah. I was not responsible for the, the title um, the translation. Um, so I don't know who, who picked the. Uh, Jimong has clarified. Title. He's a guy. Angus. Yeah. He I yeah, think, so I think uh, I think um, our editor Angus, oh. maybe maybe I can throw some. Oh my God, the editor's <laughs> in the room. <laughs> Hello, Martin. Um, hi. Uh, it, it's a very good question because um, Empire of the Peasants is actually very powerful because you associate empires with a much higher class of character. So, arguably, we could have left it alone. Um, I think when we were discussing it together and someone, and I think it was you, Daniel, came up with Empires of Dust, that appealed because it, it showed the empire rose and then fell. But... Uh, I think, if, if I remember correctly, part of the discussions at the time is, is that, at least in the UK context, peasants very much have a different common connotation than in the Chinese context, right? Peasant is, you know, Monty Python. It's like people with funny hats and a pitchfork, right? Whereas in, in, a, in a Chinese context, Nongmin, that's very much the basis of the state, right? And the, the, the two, like from a marketing perspective, which just not gelling well, like it, it's very hard to, to take this book now to a, uh, to a to a to an to a to an English audience, and then having them expect like you know Monty Python slapstick, and then instead try to sell them this very serious novel about reform and opening up, and it's it it's sometimes it's better to avoid a conversation rather than face it head on. If you see what I mean, I think that was the part of the discussion at the time. And would you say there's something a bit pejorative in the English word peasant? It can be thrown around as an insult. Indeed, indeed. I think um, it's just, I think from, a, especially from a, I think part of the discussion at the time was just at least Anglophone society, what, 
two percent, three percent of the UK population are farmers, and a lot of them are wealthy. Exactly. They're, or they're, or they're wealthy people with a business that's like a what's the word a millstone around their neck. Mm. And there's so it's not a thing that the masses do out in rural Gloucester or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So like the majority of lived experience in the UK, you're you're at least what two to three generations removed from anything to do with the land. Well, and... like I can tell a story about that where I'm from, uh, Dundee. So generation or two ago we had a thing called the tatty holidays where um the young people get a day or a long weekend off school to go pick the potatoes and we don't have the tatty holidays anymore because uh people from poland uh pick the it, actually not potatoes sorry i'm talking crap it's berries raspberries and strawberries so yeah the the the, the um that sort of work was outsourced to the eu so it's yeah the whole other world from like uh, hobe province you uh, to be a to be a farmer in this society very much means you're a business owner and quite a wealthy one at that, right? So it's like you, you have to have enough capital to be able to employ these Polish workers. You have to bring them over. There's a whole system at play. Whereas the the, the society of peasants slash farmers, how you, however you want to translate no mean, is very much operating under a different system. And it's to... So yeah, sometimes I guess some things are just on like no offense against your translation ability, Olivia, but some things are like with that much baggage attached, it's just untranslatable. Yeah, no, isn't no, it? just 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 don't <laughs> open, do not open this can of worms. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, I think after discussion, it was um, it was uh, it was one of our very early attempts actually to um, to local we well, call it localized, but to localize. Uh, a title to make sense both in their original Chinese context as well as the new English translated context they find themselves in because fundamentally the what we, we think that title is the first point of contact with uh, an audience right it's the first thing you hear about when it comes to hearing about a book someone's like you're either going to find it on a web search or someone's going to tell you about it or you're going to read about it somewhere and that's the very first point of contact and not to not to, to present something at the time where it's like, for example, like uh, no mean, it's just, it's just tricky in, when, when used in that particular context. Cause that's, if you throw an evocative title in there more people might engage with it versus not throwing an evocative title in there. So yeah. that was very much the thinking at the time. I think and, it's fair to say that it was a very finely balanced decision at the end of the day though, because um, there, there was also an appeal to the peasant empire yeah i think this is a thing in book publishing that once the thing is out there it's out there you you don't get to be george lucas and uh revise it where you can but you, you have need to a lot more money final, than we have yes you've got to make the <laughs> final yeah someone has to make a final call and push the button and you can be stuck wondering forever if you made the right decision indeed and i guess that's multiplied by the translation angle Cool. Uh, thank it's you. At 4 p.m. So I yeah. guess we shouldn't uh, uh, shouldn't keep you around if you need to be off, Olivia. I'd just like to uh, give everyone a quick update before everyone goes on a quick update on the next episode of the CLRC as well as the future of the CLRC. So we do have one additional event now lined up after this. We're partnering with China Exchange in Chinatown to uh, bring you an event on a live interview between uh, Su Tong, who've been featured on the CLRC before with uh, Shadow of the Hunter, and a conversation between her, him and Francis Wood, who, is, uh, who used to work in the China section at the British Library. And uh, it is, uh, the, I've just posted the link to the event there. It's gonna be a hybrid event. So if you're not in London, don't worry, there's gonna be a direct live Zoom link into the event as well. But uh, we're partnering with both uh, the Society of Anglo-Irish Chinese Understanding, SACU, and, um, and the China Exchange to bring you this event about a conversation between basically one of the great authors of China. And then past uh, July, where, when this event's scheduled, we're taking a slight hiatus until the kind of mid-September-ish where we're gonna have a reformat of the CLRC where we're trying to seasonalize it right now to make it like uh, to, to bring you a series of events all at once, give you more forewarning of the sort of events coming up. And uh, we're hoping to share more details with you as uh, September approaches. So we can hope you, we hope you can uh, join us for that. 
But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, thank you, uh, well, Angus and Martin and all the, all the people who joined us. And I guess uh, have a, a wonderful Sunday afternoon uh, or, or in your case, Olivia, straight to bed. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful snooze. <laughs> Cool. All right. I'll see. I'll see. I'll see everyone later then. Okay. Adios. Bye bye. Zaijian. <laughs>